Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be back in Kingston. It's, it's a great place to live. It's a great place to be challenged intellectually and physically. Great, uh, great place for kayaking and all that good stuff, even though I see the water levels are still uh, a bit high. A, a lot of familiar faces here. Uh, thank you. And, I, and I'm, I'm delighted uh, to have all the, our partners, uh, our joint partners, uh, our academic partners, and our partners from other nations. So it's a great, uh, it's a great conference. Thank you for committing to it. Uh, it's a busy time. Uh, there's no right time to do that type of conference, to be honest. Uh, you know, when I look at everybody here, um, it, it, it's hard to find the right time because this is close to the posting season. We just finished Operation Lentis uh, for the Army, both in Ontario mostly uh, and, and in Quebec. Jen, Jenny is here with us. Uh, she just returned all of her troops to the garrison. Same thing with Joel Paul, so thank you uh, to those uh, commanders for being here today. General Bose. Pleasure to have you here today. Uh, again, that, that's probably actually number 10 cases conference for you. So thank you for being the, the, the continuity here. I don't know if Wayne Air has arrived. So Wayne, are you here? Should be able to spot you at the height you are, but I don't. Tomorrow, oh shoot, I'll miss him. Uh, yeah, I have to apologize up front. I have to run away right at the uh, conclusion of my uh, challenge. Seems like I'm needed in Ottawa. Uh, you know, the reciprocal uh, thing is not necessarily true. I can't uh, say that I need Ottawa, but that's okay. Uh, and listen, thanks for the organizer. As you know, we, we got four key partners in this conference. Uh, so thank you uh, for, again, uh, Kim and, and for uh, the War College uh, and NDC, uh, along with the college here, for doing this. It, it, it is meant to be a, a seminal uh, professional development session. So we're talking about you know, the level uh, that matches for the Canadian Armed Forces, the DP5 session uh, type of engagement. So it is your conference. You will make it what you want it to be. If you sit passively uh, and, and you know, don't take notes and don't reflect, then you probably will not get as much. I mean, I, I feel humble when I look at the uh, academic potential in this room and the intellectual rigor uh, that you can all exert together. Uh, it's phenomenal. Uh, so I'm certainly not there to, to educate you. I'm there really uh, for this, uh, this opening comment to, to make you think about a few things. As you listen to our keynote speakers, our panelists, um, th th think about the, 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 you know, the, the questions I will have asked you up front uh, to stimulate you. I want to point out in the room a, a special group that we have today. Uh, at the back, Dave Henderson uh, is leading uh, with Doug Claggett, uh, the how we fight uh, doctrinal thinking. We've got to look where we need to be. We've got to look at the environment. We've got to look at those disruptive and emerging domains uh, that we're now facing. And what uh, do we do as an armed forces uh, to prepare ourselves and to be able to win uh, that fight across uh, seven domains and uh, not the, necessarily the, the three traditional domains. So they're here for two days in Kingston doing both this conference but also their own thinking, bringing all the, the, the key stakeholders in that discussion. Uh, so they, they certainly have a great deal to contribute but also to harvest from all of you. So again, uh, thank you for being here. Now, we, we've got a very uh, interesting theme this year. I, th I think it is very timely. I think it is a fascinating theme that we have. Um, we have experts among us, and uh, our panelists will really uh, you know, bring out those key elements that we need to reflect. So let, let me walk you through what I think uh, we've got to reflect as we, as we listen to our panelists and as we prepare our own questions for our panelists. So there's a resurgence um, of competition be between the great powers, uh, and those dynamics are no longer bipolar. Uh, they are increasingly uh, multipolar. There's more global powers, and there's more countries with global aspirations that are emerging. This is further complicated by plurality of non-state actors who are exercising greater influence. And that goes from corporations that are pulling uh, you know, their economic weight and up to a point their political weight almost in a near state fashion. And they're global in their nature. And then you got to the extreme end, the violent extremist organization, who are asymmetrically threatening uh, our security both at home. And some of them are acting almost legitimately as state. So how do we react to that? How do we prepare ourselves? There's more channels for tension. And those tensions tend to be more blurry than what we've been accustomed to. Uh, you know, as if the proverbial fog of war is now reaching new strategic heights. Uh, and, and then they're creating that famous gray zone. Uh, now, th there's nothing, as I said, that's binary anymore. It's no longer war and peace. Uh, we're in constant state of competition at multiple level, whether it's economic, whether it's political, whether it is in the information domain. And you, know, you, you go in a constant state of competition. You can have conflict, 
or below that you probably have a crisis, you go into conflict, and then you can go to all-out war. And they're not necessarily uh, linear in fashion. They all coexist to a certain extent, even within a specific theater. Um, and, and really, we've got to think as what is war and by definition. When we're talking about what we fight, uh, what does uh, fight mean in relations to war? Uh, you know, when we're talking about an effects-based or an outcome-based uh, approach to things, you know, we're talking about fires, but fires both from a, a munition and non-munition base. So is it possible to be at war and never yet touch a single munition? Uh, does that qualify in our current paradigm by which we envision what war is? So we've got to reflect and redefine some of the key terms we've been using. The word war has been used extensively, you know, economic wars and this and that. And, and you know, we, we kind of frown as people in uniform to that concept because for us, war has long time been associated with the traditional application of lethal violence against an adversary to coerce and convince uh, him to, to change his or her will. Uh, so what does that mean? So we all know that the international order is changing. We're mostly familiar uh, with the broad strokes of that change, but so what? I believe that this conference here will uh, ma make us better at trying to understand why it is changing why it matters to us as security and defense practitioners, as military operation commanders, as advisors, as, as decision makers. So panel one. Panel one, you will be delving into the factors driving change. And here we should aim to foster understanding, not just in a downstream fashion, but to look upstream and try to understand where we are actually heading uh, and, and where this transition is taking us. There is a long, long list of drivers that we could discuss. Let's focus on those that are most decisive from a security and defense perspective. And you know, probably the most challenging one uh, that we're facing is that, is that gray zone or hybrid warfare. But let's go back and look like we've been. Go back to the 40s, look at how Russia conducted operations and information operation. That concept is not new. What has changed the technology and the speed of that uh, ability to influence perception and, and provoke uh, and challenge and, and confuse. So that is what has changed. Our main competitors, Russia and China, uh, and to a, a lesser extent, you know, um, Iran and uh, North Korea, they threaten our, our rules-based international order uh, with disruptive activities that are clearly below the threshold of armed conflict that we're accustomed to in terms of devising responses. And it spans across all uh, facets of government activity, military, political, economic, uh, across all domains, including the cyber and information domains. This compresses and this confuses our decision making at all levels from the strategic down all the way to the tactical. We need to try to understand our adversaries' motivating factors and what are their courses of action. Why would they escalate higher than that when they're at risk of triggering a response which would be overwhelming after a, a, an amount of time? Um, sh should Russia decide to cross that threshold, you know, they, they may have an immediate tactical advantage in terms of air superiority, uh, area denial, and all these things, but ultimately the weight of NATO will crush them. Uh, why, why would they go there? Why would they not uh, continue to do what they're doing now? Because they're not triggering the response, but yet they're weakening the resolve of the alliance. Uh, they're, they're devising, they're, they're forcing things uh, on us that is not necessarily what we would be necessarily doing. So we need to understand that. How can they uh, in, inform fulsome response strategies, those factors our adversaries are considering? What constitutes an appropriate response from a state like ours, commonly, that follows a rule-based uh, international order? When you're facing a nation that does not, you're constrained by the get-go because we will respect a rule-based uh, system. Uh, we, we, we will not do things that, that violate this. So therefore, are we starting in a position of relative disadvantage? And if so, how do you change that? How do you create the conditions so that you are not, in fact, uh, on your heels when you start this? How do we understand our critical vulnerabilities? How do we arm those to transform them uh, from critical vulnerabilities into critical capabilities that enable us and you know, that, that then protect and shield our center of gravity? More than ever, combat power uh, remains important, and it needs to still exist. Uh, as we look in a resource-constrained environment, and we look at developing response, uh, you know, one would, would, would think that we probably need to, uh, in, in, in the resource-constrained environment, shift resources elsewhere. 
where effects can maybe uh, be achieved at a lower cost. But in fact, if you look at some of the trends of our key allies, you need to invest in all domains and the, 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 the traditional combat power remains relevant. Why do we care about information uh, operation uh, from Russia, but not so much from other countries? Was well, because at that border uh, with Russia, there are army groups that are amassed with incredible capabilities. The US just changed again last week an IBCT to an EBCT. So it remains important, but how do we measure the return of investment on what we're trying to do? Where do you get the best return on the limited resources that we have? Because we will never have all of the resource that we need. When you look at Canada versus US, a much more limited, where do we fit as members of a coalition in that environment? Uh, where, where and how do we remain relevant to Canadians, to Canada, to our allies, but also to our adversaries? How do you remain relevant to your adversaries really much matters? If you're relevant to an, irrelevant to an adversary, then everything else may not matter. And when it's time uh, to, to work and then, you know, for a government to ensure economic security of its country, then you may not be irrelevant in that discussion. So those are things that we have to think about. What is the role of the military uh, from a Canadian perspective and the Canadian military, uh, or sorry, national security apparatus? Uh, every nation deals with this all of government approach in a different pattern. What has to be our approach? What is the role of the military versus the other departmental uh, organization versus the public sector versus the private sector? What is the national response to those emerging threats in the gray zone? Is the gray zone the new normal? Or what will it evolve into? Is it something that will morph into something more challenging? Are there other important drivers that we are maybe not thinking about, that we're failing to recognize, that we could inform our thinking about our positioning in 10, 20, 50 years from now. So those are things that I hope will be flushed out uh, when you hear the panelists and you, you interrogate uh, the panelists uh, for panel one. Switching over the perspective uh, of a changing world order, you know, we'll have the three panels on the Americas, North Atlantic, and the Indo-Pacific. Uh, so we'll investigate during those panel how the transformation in the international order is affecting particular regions, you know, those three that I've mentioned. And looking to those regional lenses is important to improve our situational awareness of our own land, current and potential expeditionary partners. Continental defense with the United States remains one of our primary mission. We want to protect Canadian, protect North America and engage in the world. Uh, so Europe and NATO are also still at the very core of our defense policy and a greater engagement in the Pacific theater is critical for us. You know, economic security uh, goes uh, through uh, the Indo-Pacific theater for Canada, for North America. Close to home, home, the policies of our southern neighbor and most important uh, partners, the US, are shifting. As North American defense has a high degree of integration, I'm interested to hear what experts have to see an implication for our own national defense policies. Are there areas where we have traditionally leaned on the U.S. and where we need to strive for greater autonomy, uh, greater uh, autonomous capabilities for both our national interests and for our own credibility towards our principal uh, allied partner? In Europe and in NATO, we have LC, yet you could argue divisive uh, debates over defense spending, populism, nationalism, integration, immigration. Uh, does that endure our deterrence and collective defense posture in the face of adversaries such as Russia, who aim exactly to sow a division uh, and undermine a cohesion as an alliance. The North American view is quite different than many of our uh, European partners who experience a different situation. Uh, and you know, when you're dependent on Russia uh, for the energy sector, uh, that changes your dynamic. How do we reconcile those different views? And with the NATO, uh, I, I, I spent an hour with uh, the Italian Chad, so certainly his view and his interests lay on the southern flank, you know, in the two first bands in Africa versus the eastern flank, which is not for him such an existential threat as for the Baltic state. How do we, as an alliance that keeps growing, reconcile this, prepare ourselves and work together uh, to, to make sure that uh, we are not undermined? In Asia, it is very hard to miss the growing trade tension, uh, which also touch on national security matters with concerns over cyber and espionage between the US and China, amongst others, and ourselves. At the same time, Tension in the South China Sea are not going away. The nuclear powers that are India and Pakistan often seem on the verge of erupting into conflict. 
Those tensions are more or less constrained, but they persist a risk for escalation. What is the risk of miscalculation? What is the risk of interference? What is the risk of, of manipulation that creates a crisis that should not have happened because it is based on false perception? How real is it? What are the contingencies we need to be planning to be able to operate should, should such uh, a situation occur? Interstate dynamics in the Indo Pacific are complex. And except for Afghanistan, I would argue, which present a, a, a quite different uh, theater compared to other Asian states and, and areas. It's an operational area for which we probably have less familiarity uh, based on our experience for the past few decades. And I speak from a Canadian perspective. So we're, we're lucky to have Wayne Air uh, that, that went over uh, as deputy commander there. It gave us a tremendous insight on what's going on. It, it made us uh, aware. It created relationship. It was a great opportunity for us uh, to be uh, doing this. But how does Canada and the CAV best position themselves to play a relevant and positive, positive role uh, in the region? Uh, now, it's a scan perspective. The U.S. has a slightly different perspective. Certainly, Europe has, has an even different perspective. So understanding the perspective of each of our allies will be very uh, useful for us uh, collectively to determine how we work together uh, in that, uh, that environment. Who should be uh, our key partners uh, in the Indo-Pacific is a question we've got to ask ourselves. What could, what should, what must we do uh, in that theater? You know, can forging for us, the Canadian Army, for example, a stronger army-to-army -army relationship with Japan be the way forward? We've got a great relationship with Australia and New Zealand. That's the gateway uh, for us right now in the Indo-Pacific. But how do we evolve? How do we move in uh, into uh, a better relationship? And more generally, with countries like Russia and China exerting more and more influence beyond their immediate borders, uh, especially in the case of China with global endeavors, uh, such as the Belt and Road Initiative, to what extent do we need to be concerned uh, that more nations develop ties and fall under their umbrella? Should we be concerned? Should we try to compete? Should we try to cooperate? What, what has to be our relationship? Our partner regions becoming more agreeable to the type of international norms promulgated by Russia and China. What does that mean to the overall rule-based international order as those influences further dilute what uh, we've been used to? Then we'll move to panel five, commonalities and security implication. Uh, this will bring our discussions together to endeavor to form a common picture of the situation at hand and better understand how this affects security and defense. Let me offer a few thoughts on security and defense implication that, that strikes me the most. First, the strategic operational tactical levels are emerging. Since the end of the Cold War, the level of command influencing mission success has been shifting from general commanding a division towards the battle group and lower. Uh, and, and certainly, for those that have been following the evolving doctrine led by CJOC, that is certainly part of, uh, of, of how we're looking at this. So the decision at the lowest level, because of that compression from the strategic to the tactical and the speed of information, have immediate strategic consequence and leave commanders with little uh, to no time to intervene. Things progress at, at a speed which make the relevance uh, of, of what we do even more critical. Second, as, as Western nations, as democracies, we cannot take the technological, technological edge which enabled our material superiority for granted anymore. Adversary are quickly progressing. They're propelled by autocratic models of governance. They integrate the military and private sectors to streamline military progress. They bypass democratic uh, processes and rules. And ethical questioning uh, that, that binds ourselves. Uh, they, they don't live in that bureaucracy. They don't have to ensure ITBs. They don't have to ensure a fair procurement process. Uh, how do we compete against that? How do we change our mindset and, and our own internal way of doing things if we want to remain relevant? We will always abide by the core principle under which we operate, but it's imperative that we balance them with operational realities to meet our national security and defense needs. How do we do that? How do you afford it? You know, if, if, I, if I look at, for example, you know, the technology that we're finding in an armored fighting vehicle, a high degree of technology, you know, let's say the lav, outsourced to uh, you know, GDLS as the prime contractor. But how do you control the supply chain? How do you ensure that every component of that supply chain is controlled so there are no weaknesses in the vehicle? Well, if you want to control you know, your, your entire supply chain to, to the, every single electronic component, we cannot afford that vehicle. Uh, it, it, it is a reality of, of the, the global uh, way uh, the economy works in the defense. So how do we change some of those paradigms to not expose uh, vulnerabilities? The world is changing. 
Shows the nature of military operations. We witness the return of deterrence as a primary strategy, diffuse tensions, avoid conflict, as the NATO EFP uh, is the obvious example. In an environment of persistent tensions, how do we achieve and maintain deterrence while avoiding undue escalation and unwanted conflict? How do you do that dance? How do you stay in step but avoid the mistake uh, that, that leads to something we're absolutely trying to avoid? How do we best integrate all elements of the national power, the whole of government, I would dare say the whole of nation? We need to graduate from a whole of government to a whole of nation. If we don't leverage the private sector, uh, if we don't conscientize the private, uh, the private sector and the industry to the security uh, challenge that threatens our economic interests, then, then we will not be able uh, to deliver what we need. The spectrum of military operations and, uh, and, and necessary capabilities, which is always, uh, already very large, will keep expanding. With hybrid warfare, rapid technological advance, uh, as I mentioned, we don't have three, we're talking about seven domains of operation. You know, the three traditional land, air, uh, maritime, you, you had the cyber, the space, information operations, and yes, sustainment, not as a function, but as a domain itself. Um, how do we integrate those? How do we see the world through that? Because ultimately, those seven domains only lead to the only domain that I would argue matters, the human, human, human domain of uh, the French uh, stuff in the morning sometimes but the, the, the human domain that's the one that matters because no matter what we do it is about changing the perception and will of our adversary so all of those uh, need, need to lead one thing it is changing uh, the will of our adversary so I think I, I'll, I'll wrap it up uh, pretty much here um, those discussion will be critical to inform the way ahead uh, where we want to be how we position ourselves. We are at a, a, an inflection point that I, in my 30 years in uniform, I, I think is unprecedented uh, in, in terms of the level of complexity and ambiguity uh, that we're facing, the risks, the speed at which those risks can materialize, our ability to react to them, uh, the, the diverging views of all uh, our different partners uh, across alliances. Uh, it, it, it is a fascinating time, and we've got to get it right. We've got to understand, we've got to be able to project ourselves, where will we be in 10, 20, 30, 50 years? The decision we make today will influence our structure, will influence capabilities we procure, and capabilities that we procure are there for 50 years. You procure them, if they're material, they're there for 20 years, then it's not end of life. You do, uh, uh, it's called a mid-grade uh, or mid-life upgrade because it, it doubles the life of the platform. So how do we understand the capabilities needed and build them so that they are actually able uh, to evolve and, and adapt to the environment. And the same goes with our doctrine and everything else <coughs> that applies to it. So again, uh, welcome to the conference. I wish you a, an excellent conference. Uh, network, this, this, this is also uh, the reason uh, of this. And I think, uh, Steve, that the idea of having a cruise is phenomenal. People are bound, they cannot escape. They have to talk to each other in a constrained area uh, and do that uh, is gonna be phenomenal. Uh, learn about each other, uh, exchange business card, and stay in touch, and continue that healthy debate that we're initiating today. So, merci beaucoup à tout le monde. Je vous souhaite une excellente conférence, et uh, j'attends avec impatience d'être capable de lire le compte rendu de la conférence. I also encourage you, we got a series of kiosks in the hallway there from all our partners and sponsors. Please stop and, and uh, engage and, and, and grab that literature that is there for you, and uh, take a few extras for your, your friends back at home. So, merci beaucoup, et bonne conférence.